my name is Rashmi Dayalu, and I work with uh, Dimagi Incorporated, which is a mobile tech company just right here in um, Central Square. And I'm the data scientist with the company, and um, you can see on your sheet over here, it's listed as research collaboration. So this is really just to give people a flavor for what um, me and my data team are doing at Dimagi. And if you are interested, or if you know anyone else who's interested, um, who has great ideas, we've got a lot of really interesting data, um, just definitely let me know. So just to give you a background on what we do, um, we our mission statement is we deliver open and innovative technology to help underserved communities around the world. Okay, so you wonder, well, what does mobile technology have to do with this? Um, and it really feeds into one really important aspect, that healthcare access specifically, we know a lot of resources are limited uh, around the world, but healthcare access specifically is limited in most parts of the world. Um, here's a graph which might be familiar to some people here. Um, it doesn't show up very well, but basically it shows by country ratios of something to something. Um, and you can see like the bigger, uh, the, 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 the bigger discrepancy in the ratio, the bigger the number, and the smaller discrepancy, the smaller the number. Um, can anyone just hazard a guess as to what this ratio might be, uh, might be showing here? Say it again. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is basically showing uh, the number of patients um, to doctors. So in, if you look in the United States, you look at Western Europe, pretty, pretty decent sized ratio. Um, but if you look at um, places like South Asia or Africa, the, the, the ratio is insane. Um, it's 50,000 patients to, to one doctor. And this is a big problem. So how does, um, we have to think, how does mobile technology fit into this? So the main thing that we decided was that we knew that there was a niche in one area that we could really actually create impact. And that's with what are called frontline workers. If you aren't familiar with this term, um, frontline workers are often in these areas where that ratio is very unbalanced. Frontline workers are often the primary link between um, patients or clients and any type of standardized healthcare. So um, you can't have doctors going from village to village. Um, they're often in um, the hospitals going crazy, running around like chickens with their heads cut off. So you can't really have them do this. So we need people who are what are called frontline workers that are often sort of sometimes illiterate. Um, it, the, 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 the range actually varies very much, or they could be more like a, trained like a nurse. But it really depends on the program that, that hires them, and they're actually trained usually within the context of a program, and they go out and deliver services, not necessarily, not complicated um, medical services, but often uh, counseling, data collection, and actually um, referral to um, services if need be. Um, so these are called frontline workers, and they're um, very, the, the, these workers are exploding in um, all, over the, all over South Asia, all over Africa. They're very much um, the link between patients and any type of standardized healthcare. So what we decided is um, to develop a tool which is called ComCare, and that's a platform that we've developed. And it's a mobile solution basically for case management, data collection, and supervision of the frontline worker workforce. So it's a mobile app that you can just put on a phone like that, a regular tiny uh, Java phone, or if you have an Android, you can put it on that as well. And um, that's instead of carrying around pieces of paper, um, you can actually uh, uh, visit clients and do everything in real time and collect it electronically, collect information electronically. And that is linked to a server that um, supervisors can later on look at. So what we, um, so that's basically what we do. Um, we're a leader in open source uh, mobile technology, um, especially for healthcare. Um, so our code is free on the internet. Really, anyone can download it. It's a platform, and you can just um, uh, download any. You can actually create your own apps. You can do uh, whatever you need to do, um, whatever your workflow might be. Um, if you actually download an app, it actually you don't need software developers to deploy it. You can deploy it any part of the world, and you can do it on your own. You don't need any special expertise. So to date, we have um, upwards of 170 plus active projects in 40 different countries around the world. Um, and though I am focusing on healthcare here, um, we actually do have uh, projects that are in various different sectors, such as agriculture and microfinance, gender equality. Um, many, about eight, eight different sectors right now um, we, we have projects in. And um, our partners include a variety of partners. They're not just government organizations, they're also NGOs, grassroots organizations. 
and anyone really who just wants this type of uh, a mobile solution to their workflow can, can use this software. <coughs> and I would say one of the plus points for me, one of the biggest things for me about working with this company is that we have 80 plus people, but it's, it's, we have scientists, we have public health experts, we have physicians, engineers, software engineers, so it's a really good balance in terms of trying to get our minds together and trying to, um, trying to actually solve this issue of inequality in healthcare. So our governing principle, which is sort of what I'm going to focus on um, a lot in the next few minutes, is we care most about, this is really true, actually. I have experiences with, with this company. Our first thing that we care about the most is actually creating impact in the world, actually making a change. Um, the second thing is team satisfaction. We want our people to be happy. The third thing is profit. So we are not nonprofit, but the purpose for the profit is not for profit itself. It's actually so that we could create more impact and create uh, be better team satisfaction. So it really is in that order. Um, the way we started off was through this design under a mango tree concept. Um, we're not sitting in Cambridge Central Square, MIT area saying, we think you need a mobile solution that looks like this. Um, we actually went out into the field and worked very closely, what you see um, uh, some of our staff working with the frontline um, workers out on the field, going back, making a new iteration of the product, coming back saying, does this work? So it really is just the talking with the user themselves and figuring out what we need, what they need. So the result of this is that we actually have stronger healthcare workers. Um, we have improved data collection. We have improved counseling for people who wouldn't normally receive these services. We have um, training reinforcement, supervision of the frontline workers to make sure that they're all up to date. And then um, workflow support in terms of uh, helping them do their job better. So here's the million dollar question. This is where stage right I enter. Um, is calm care usage actually providing positive impact to frontline workers and their clients? It's really easy to say, yes, our product, if you use our product, you will create positive impact. Can we actually prove that? And this is where data comes into the picture. The two things we have to measure in this statement is one, what do we mean by calm care usage? And two, what do we mean by positive impact? This is a huge question. Can't cover it in the next three minutes. Um, but I will focus a little bit on this question of usage. What do we mean by usage? Um, if you think of calm care usage, you could say, OK, well, are you talking about the number of cases that you visit? Are you talking about the amount of time that you spend with each case? Are you talking about the, num the proportion of days in a month that you're actually visiting clients versus not? Usage can be a big question of, of uh, quality, quantity. And maybe it's all of those things. Maybe it's only one of those things. Maybe it's more of one than another. And so that's what um, my job is to figure out what do we mean by usage and in what context? And how do we finally link that to impact? So I looked at, just for the purpose of this presentation, I looked at um, 73 health sector projects in 23 different countries around the world. And um, our big data for ComCare basically is metadata based on what frontline workers actually enter on the phone. So the only the four variables we get from this are the frontline worker ID, the case ID, so that's the patient that they're visiting, when they start entering information, and when they stop entering information, both on date and time, based on local date and time. And for these uh, 73 different projects, this is the total cases visited from the beginning of 2012, I believe, through uh, roughly July of this year. And we started off with, in 2012, few hundred cases, and then, and then basically exponentially went up to, we're up at about 75,000 cases now in terms of unique cases that were, that were visited. And I divided that up, this graph doesn't show very well, but I divided that up by um, health subsector. So we have many different sub subsectors. Um, maternal child health is the main green one that you see. So a lot of these are MCH, maternal child health workflows, where Frontline workers go and visit pregnant women and give them counseling services and to make sure that they know exactly what's going on with their pregnancy. Our second uh, biggest subsector is nutrition, and our third biggest uh, subsector is family planning. So that's how, that's how that looks. And here's an interesting one. So that's sort of the overall cumulative, if you just actually look at per month how many cases you're visiting. This is actually by user. So this is looking at the mean number of cases visited 
in a month, starting from their first month using the, our tool to their X month using the tool. And um, the gray area is the 95% is the confidence interval. Um, so the, ignore the sort of the first spike in the beginning, but we basically see the number of cases visited per month is between 50 and roughly 70, and it, and, and it varies between that. So that's per frontline worker um, in, of these 73 projects. This one is interesting. It might look the same, but it's actually very interesting. This is cases followed up. So the unique cases followed up. The, the previous uh, graph in, included registrations. If you visited someone multiple times, they would still uh, count in that. But then this is actually unique cases followed up. And we actually see that people who stay around using our tool for a longer period of time follow up with more of their cases. And, and, and maybe they um, are trained better. Maybe they, um, they find this tool very useful. Don't know. But this is actually an interesting usage pattern that we see here. This one was interesting. So this is percentage of active days by month index. So this is literally looking at, in a month, what proportion are they actually using our tool? And that seems to actually go down over time. Now, that's another question, right? Higher numbers in usage don't always mean better. Does this mean, don't always uh, mean that it's a good thing? So does this mean that they're actually declining in their usage? Or does it mean that they're becoming more effective and visiting their clients in, in a more standardized way? We don't know. It could mean either of those things. And then finally, this is an interesting one that I just threw in there just to show the different types of things we're looking at. This is looking at attrition rate um, in terms of churn. So if a frontline worker is logged, in, logged into our system and then stops using um, our system after a month, um, we, we want to know from month to month what proportion, what percentage of our frontline workers actually dropping off the face of the earth. And that's very important. Is our, is our tool not helping them? Um, so we definitely want to monitor this. And we see roughly um, uh, under 20% of frontline workers, for some reason, um, stop, stop using our tool. Maybe start again. There's another graph that I have, which I haven't added in here. We also have to think of who, who comes back into the system. But So there are all these different things that we can look at. And um, we're trying to interface between what we have here and what people don't have, and um, trying to create an impact and trying to understand, are we actually doing what we're saying we're doing? So that's the spiel, and um, if you have any questions, or if you would like to contact me, um, here's my um, email, and our company is just dimagi.com. Thank you very much. So you're looking at healthcare data across many national borders. How do you manage data privacy in an enormously complicated problem like this? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. So right now, which is what's nice about this metadata is that I'm only looking at metadata. I'm not actually looking at patient data just yet. Um, though the impact question, which is another project that I'm on, is huge, and we do have to think about that. So our our server is HIPAA compliant, um, and I would say that that's actually what makes our our company unique as well. A lot of the um, organizations that deal with patient data from um, third world countries can get away with it. They actually, it's easy to not be HIPAA compliant, but we want to basically maintain the same standard that we have here and bring it to, um, to people who don't have it, not only in terms of technology, but also in terms of privacy. So we have um, a legal staff, uh, a legal person on, on our staff who just does only that. Um, this is a great question, and I don't want to take too much time from David because he's going to be next. But I will say that it just goes back to the question of usage. So when we have this general idea of this is what we want to understand, it's often much more nuanced than we think it is. So you can go in with an idea of this is what I think uh, my data should tell me, or this is what I want my data to tell me. But you really have to, it, it's al it almost becomes, I think, from a data question to a philosophical question. You know you're reducing something, so you have to be very wise about the assumptions that you're making. You know you're going to make assumptions, so just know what they are and see if you can back them up. 